Tonight, we will be talking about Capture One Pro, which is a piece of software which I'm sure you've all heard of. And I'm sure you've all wondered, if, and this is assuming you don't already use it, what all the fuss is about, because it's generally regarded as being pretty much the, the cream of the raw processor applications out there. And I know a lot of you use Lightroom, and currently I use Lightroom most of the time too. So what is it about Capture One that makes it considered so special? We are very lucky this evening to have um, Capture One Pro's resident training guru, David Grover, um, joining us from London. Uh, David, are you there? I there am. he is. Yep. Hi, Nick. Hi. Hi. <laughs> and David amazing. is going to pretty much take over the show and and present to you an overview of Capture One Pro. And then obviously we'll be taking questions either at the end, or you can type questions into the Q&A or chat as we go. I, I don't really mind. I'll be checking those out. So David is, um, he's the guy who knows everything about Capture One Pro. He's done our internal training at Leica for us. And uh, without blowing your trumpet too much, it's probably nothing that, that <laughs> if you don't know it, we don't need we don't need to know it about Capture One Pro. So um, I'm just going to really step back from this and let David slot into his familiar role as a Capture One Pro trainer. And please, like I said, feel free to um, drop in some questions. We prefer it in the Q&A if you can, just keeps it a bit easier to keep track, but it's okay if you use the chat as well. Yeah, sure. As Nick said, my name's David. I'm part of the Capture One team based out of uh, Copenhagen in Denmark. Normally, I'm going back and forth, but for obvious reasons, that, that doesn't happen right now. So as Nick said, I'm talking to you from the other side of the world, uh, just outside London. Um, and it's my job to look after the educational requirements of Capture One. So teaching the partners like Leica, um, other manufacturers, our resellers, uh, customers as well, of course. So anyone who needs uh, to know about Capture One. So shall I um, share my screen, Nick, as well? I think that's a really good idea. It should good be. Good idea would be help, wouldn't it? That. Otherwise, we're not going to get very far. Make sure you can. Uh, <laughs> let's just bring up the desktop too. Just give me a shout. Excellent. There we go. Perfect. Yeah. Let me just That's bring looking the good chat back to me. up as well. Uh, All right. Chat. Right. Well, I'm going to step. I'm going to step back. So I'll leave it up to you, David. And feel free yep. if you need anything from me. But otherwise. I know you'll give us a very good um, explanation of how it all works. <laughs> I'll try. I'll do my best. So this hour will just be to inspire you to look further, get you up and running a bit quicker and point out some of the special things uh, about Capture One as well. And as Nick said, if you've got a question, you're welcome to, to pop that in and then I'll keep an eye on it as uh, as we go. So what we do is just to run through how it will flow. Um, we take the scenario if you're looking at Capture One for the first time, get some photos into it so you know how the import process works. Uh, for those of you on Lightroom, it's, it's very similar. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the interface because that is obviously different from Light, Lightroom in a good way, I would say. And a little nod to the, some of the customi customization that you can do as well. And then we we'll just run through a few edits. That's the best way to see how Capture One works in context with actually editing some photos. And it's a bit more interesting as well. And then we look at how to export to very quickly. All right, so uh, currently on screen, we've got a Capture One catalog open. Now, I'm going to close this one down and just show you how to create a catalog. And we might return to this one as there's more photos in it uh, if I need to find anything else. So let's close this one down. I'm assuming you've managed to, of course, uh, when you look at it, install Capture One. That's all relatively simple. So I'm not going to bore you with that. So first of all, we're going to say File New Catalog. And this is very similar to a Lightroom library. So it's a database. It tracks where your photos are. It knows the adjustments of your photos, metadata, all those kinds of things as well. So let's say new catalog. I'm going to call that Leica Academy and try to remember to spell it correctly. And uh, right now we're just creating the catalog. Um, images we'll come to in a second. Now by default your Catalog will go into your pictures folder. If we want to change that, then we can just click this little button here and put your catalog anywhere else. And that's essentially as similar to the, sorry, I'll press my wrong shortcut key, like a academy. Uh, essentially, it's similar to creating the Lightroom LRCAT, essentially. 
So let's say, okay, and we're gonna have a brand new empty catalog ready to take some photos. We'll look at the interface in a second. It's hard to explain the interface without having some photos into it. So let's get some photos in first, and then we can have a little look around the interface. Hopefully you've noticed the enormous import images of the screen. That will always show up in the center when you have a brand new empty catalog. In the future, if you want to import, then you've got your import button just up in the top left hand of the interface. So let's go ahead and say import uh, images. And then it's just looking at my last collection of shots. So let's just reset that like so. And I just want to make sure I don't have any weird naming. So I'm going to reset that as well. And I'll run through these in a second so you know what's going on. So really, this import dialog is a top to bottom view. So where do we want to get our images from? And what do we want to do with them? So let's go and find some Leica shots. So I'm going to choose. And I've got a bunch of Leica stuff on this small external hard drive. It's just a little SSD hanging off my computer. So let's go and find some Leica shots. So I'm going to use some from Nick's counterpart in the UK, which is uh, Robin. So I'm just going to select this folder and say review for import. And that's going to show me the contents of Robin's folder like so. Now a new feature which was added relatively recently, which if those of you on Capture One might not have picked up on that, is if you want to look at the photos a little larger, you can click on this viewer button here, and then you'll see them in a higher resolution. Now the resolution of this depends very much on the camera. So some of the, the, the shots might be blurry, some will be a better quality like this one. So we're just looking at the JPEG preview that's embedded uh, onto uh, the shot itself. If I was importing from a memory card, then I can also use this functionality as well. The reason why you, why you might want to use this larger viewer is if you're deciding exactly which uh, photos to um, import. So, so my shortcut key is, uh, I have this issue with this keyboard that sometimes it gets stuck on a shift key or an option key. So if you see me do anything strange, that's why. Okay, so just to recap, you've got this viewer click on and off to see the larger photo if you wish. Now notice each photo has got a little check mark next to it. So that means it's going to be imported when we decide what we want to do with them. By default, everything is always checked. If you want to not import something like a bad exposure, you know, misfire or something like that, you can just easily uncheck it by clicking this box. You can also use a shortcut key, which you might find easier which is showing down here under keyboard shortcuts. So if I just hover over that, you can see the result pick. Let's rewind that and get back to the import dialog box. <laughs> exactly, so sorry all about right. that. All right, to it. no problem. Fingers crossed, we're all good this time. Let me just get the chat up. All right, so let's uh, rewind a bit, hang on, so. Uh, let's open our Leica Academy and go back to the import images dialog. Right, so we had defined, let's just bring up mouse pose for a second. Uh, we had defined where we were getting our photos from. So that was uh, Robin's folder. And then we want to define where we're going to put them to. So by default, it will say add to catalog. So that means the photos will stay where they are. We're not gonna move them. They were on a little external hard drive. If you remember, Capture One will just add them to the catalog. So it's identical to uh, Lightroom in that respect. Now, in terms of naming, as we are adding them to the catalog, no renaming will take place. And we can also add some further things like metadata, uh, a preset if we wish, and so on. But as today, we're keeping it simple. We just stick with those simple things like so. I'm going to import some more in a second, just so you know where you're or how to browse different collections once we've imported. So let's say import all. And we should be able to see our images popping in like so. So that's our 27 images coming in nicely. Let's just open something up. And then we'll talk about the interface in a second. Now that we've got some photos into it, it's uh, easy to see what's happening. All right. 
So where are my photos? As I said, they're exactly where they were on that little external hard drive. Uh, if you cast your eyes to the uh, top left, the first tool tab is where we organize our library. Let's just close filters for a second. And you can see if I expand out the file tree here, we can see uh, that in this exact location, we've got 27 shots from Robin, like so. At the top of the library tool here, we've got some shortcuts and these are just fixed collections. So there's nothing we can change here, but it simply shows you the entirety of your photos in your catalog. The last 10 imports that you made, uh, recent captures if you shot tethered, um, won't be time for that today, but that's also something we can look at in the future. User collections, which is where we can create things like albums and smart albums, collections, as they're known in Lightroom, and then the folders area, which shows you exactly where your pictures are. So if I was to import something else, what would happen? So let's go now go back into our import dialog. And this time, let's choose a different collection of pictures. So they're in the, the same hard drive, but let's find stuff from Phil Penman. He's a Leica photographer, also from the UK, but based in New York. So let's grab Phil's collection of pictures. Now you can, just so you know, if I do a, a, a command select, Apple select if you're on Mac, or it would be option if you're on PC, you can actually tag uh, more than one folder if you wish. So if I did a shift select, I could look at the contents of those three pictures uh, at the same time. Or I could look at all those pictures if I wanted to. Um, but we're just gonna grab Phil's pictures. So let's go and find Phil Penman's folder and say review for import. Same process, we've got all of Phil's shots here. We can untap, sorry, uncheck if we wished, but let's just import all of these where they are as well. Now, if you were coming from a memory card before I hit import all and get excited, uh, you can also have a different option, which is copy to folder. So obviously if I had a load of stuff on a memory card, I wouldn't want to leave it on the memory card. I want to copy it to somewhere safe. So that's where that option is. Again, very similar to Lightroom. So let's just import all of those as well. Now we can see the numbers change here because in all of my, uh, my entire catalog, there's 98 shots. At 10.52, my time, we brought 71 in. And at 10.49, we brought 27 in. And now we can see Phil's collection and Robin's collection, like so. So all fairly simple stuff in that respect. Okay, now we've got some photos in, uh, we can get an idea of how Capture One's interface looks. So you've already been hinted to the fact that we have some different tabs up here which contain different tools, uh, which do different tasks. So just to highlight one, this Exposure Tool tab, and if I hover over it, you get the little Help bubble pop up. This deals with exposure related things, color related things, and so on. So different tools divided into different tool tabs over on the left. In the center is what we refer to as the viewer. So this is where we see our photo or photos that we're editing on. And on the right hand side is our browser, which is where we can select the current photo to see in the viewer. Or if we select multiple, so if I just shift select for a second, then we can see more than one photo in the viewer and work on them individually or at the same time. Along the top here, so we've got our cursor tools, which is a little bit different to how Lightroom behaves. So these change the behavior of the cursor and you'll see if I hover over them, then you'll get a reminder about what it does. And some of them have a link to a tutorial, which is good to know. And there's also the reminder of the shortcut key as well. So the cursor tools change the behavior of the cursor. And then also on the, the uh, top here, we've got some buttons which turn things turn various things on and off, like the before and after grid, um, reset, and a few other things that we just mentioned as we go through the session. Now, in terms of the cursor tools, it's probably highly unlikely you'll ever use all of these. If you can remember this one, so that's the pan tool, H on your keyboard, and you can remember this one C, which is the crop tool. 
that's just a couple of handy shortcuts which help you switch easily from a pan tool, which you can use to double click to zoom into 100%. And see if I tap C on my keyboard, and then a crop tool, obviously, to crop your shot as well. So if you can remember those two shortcuts, that will just help you navigate nice and quickly. Now, if you're looking at this layout thinking, this doesn't work for me, uh, then good news is that everything is customizable. Now, I won't go through every single option because that is a webinar in itself. But if you notice the things that I mentioned, the toolbar, the viewer, the browser, and the tools, they all have a customize option. So for example, if you prefer your uh, tools to be on the right hand side, then you can easily place them over on the right as one example. Your browser can move to the bottom. You can change the order of the tool tabs that we looked at. You can add and remove tools from each one. So there's really a lot you can do to shape the interface to uh, your needs as well. Also over on the tool tabs, there's a, a subtle thicker black line you can see here. And this defines the fixed area and the scrolling area. So you can fix a couple of tools on any tool tab that you wish. And then you can also have this uh, scrolling area. Now the contents of each tool tab, as I said, you can define as well. So if I do a simple right click, then I can add a tool, remove a tool, add my own tool tab if I wish, and so on. And the order of these tools uh, you can manipulate. So if you prefer to have like, let's move our level tools up, then we can shift them around too. Or indeed, we can float them out into the main workspace. So have a play around with the interface. Uh, if you can make it work better for you, which I'm sure you can, don't forget to save your workspace. Then you can always return to it. And if you make a complete mess of it, you can also go back to the default, which will just reset it as is. You'll find something called migration, which just shifts the panels around to a more light roomy look. So that would be the tools on the right hand side, browser at the bottom and so on. So just have a play around with those as well. OK, so um, let's have a look at very quickly some similarities between all the tools. So when you're editing, adjusting, what kind of shortcuts and things can you do to speed things up? So let's drag the exposure tool out for a second. I'm sure you're all capable of dragging a slider and seeing the result, nothing different there. Um, if you want to preview what the slider is doing, so if I long press on exposure, I can get just a brief before and after, which is quite handy just to see the result. Uh, to reset to zero, and you've just seen me doing it subconsciously, uh, becomes second nature. You can double click anywhere on the slider bar and it'll take you back to zero. That's way faster than trying to uh, reset it. Uh, let's just uh, mess up this shot for a second and put some different values in. Uh, to reset everything back to zero, you've got a reset button there, like so. If you want to temporarily preview everything that's happening in a particular tool, if you hold your Alt key down, you can click and it will just give you a temporary reset, like so. This little magic wand, the first one, this will just do an auto adjust of the tool itself. Copy and apply, which we'll come back to at some point, but basically you can copy one tool setting from a photo to another tool. You've also got your global copy and apply up in the top right hand corner too. Uh, the three lines allows you to apply some different presets and manage those by saving and creating. And then the last one, the three dots, this is just a sub menu which allows you to do various different things depending which tool is open. So for the exposure tool, we can change the defaults for a particular camera as for the other tools. So if you feel your, in this case, M240 always looks better with extra contrast, then you can save that as a default for that camera. So it's almost like a permanent preset, if you like. Okay, so let's tuck that tool back away and actually just talk about some editing um, because that's really the best way to see the power um, of Capture One. Um, and in context with photos, it's just, as I said, a lot more interesting. So we'll run through 
how are we doing for time? It's amazing how much time you burn up when things break. Um, so we run through uh, a few edits to see how we're doing, uh, keep an eye on the time, and then that will just you know pull in a bunch of the various different tools and some of the special stuff as well. Okay, so as we are in uh, the Exposure Tool tab, let's start there. <coughs> Excuse me. So I'm sure most of you are aware of exposure contrast and saturation. Brightness is maybe slightly more unique to capture one. So we'll pull out a different photo to look at this one. Exposure is really the best analogy to changing the exposure on the camera itself. So obviously increasing or decreasing exposure will brighten and darken everything to relatively the same amount. There's some care going on in the background that when you increase exposure there's a little bit of highlight protection but it's just a small amount so it's almost like a linear change throughout the whole shot so the closest analogy to making the photo brighter or darker is if you changed it on your camera um, contrast does what it says on the tin but there's actually something really interesting about the contrast slider which we shall have a look at. Oh, by the way, you'll see me do this, which is essentially hiding the viewer and just seeing a grid of photos. Now, each of these options, so like viewer, browser, tools, notice there's a shortcut key next to it. So that allows me to hide or show it. So if I did Command B or Control B if you're on a PC, that would hide my browser. If I do this, which is a squiggle, <laughs> which is the key under my escape key, now, I don't know if Australian keyboard layout is the same as the UK, but that's the one that sits under my escape key. So I find it very easy just to use that to toggle the viewer on and off. By default, it's G, again, similar to uh, Lightroom. Um, I just saw a question actually from Sean. He says, I've tried the app before, but I was overwhelmed by lots of different tools. Exactly. So if there's something that you're not using, just get rid of it. Like if you're never going to shoot tethered, this whole tool tab, just remove that entire tool tab. So let's get rid of that as an example. So you can simplify it down or just really focus on these two tool tabs, if you like, exposure and color. Pretty much everything that you need to do is sitting within those tool tabs. Okay, um, so we I was talking about the contrast tool. So if I hide my viewer with my shortcut key, I want to find something with a nice strong uh, dominant color like a blue. So let's go for this one as we've got a strong blue sky. And what we're going to do is we're going to make a virtual copy of this, which is a new variant. So this allows you to try different adjustments on a photo, perhaps do a black and white and so on. Now it doesn't copy the raw file just gives us a virtual copy. So if I say new variant, now we've got one and two, I'm gonna do another one, and we're gonna do one more as well. So we've got four of the same shot. So if I bring my viewer back, and I'm gonna shift select all of these, so we've got four of the same photo, and I'm gonna hide my browser, so we've got a bit more space. So image number one, we're not gonna do anything with. Image number two, I'm gonna pump in a few points of contrast, so you can see it changing as I drag my slider. So let's put it relatively more than I would normally do on an edit. So let's make it relatively strong. Bottom left, let's do a more traditional method, which is using a curve. So some of you who are maybe a bit more experienced in Photoshop are well used to using curves. So let's just throw in an S curve and add in, you know, a fairly big dollop of contrast as well. And this one on the bottom right, we're going to throw in a luma curve. What's a luma curve? Well, it's still allowing us to adjust contrast, but it doesn't have any influence over the color of the shot. So it's purely luminosity values that are changing. So it's very different to RGB. So to recap, nothing. This one, a few points of our contrast slider. This one was an RGB curve, which we can see here, and this one is a Luma curve. So what can we see between these? Um, first of all, on the top right, this was our contrast slider. We're going to come back to that. So if we look at the bottom left and bottom right, these are the interesting ones. So this was our RGB curve. Now notice compared to our original, 
that the blue sky is more saturated, the trees are more saturated, as we would kind of expect, because if we're standing in a sunny spot like this, bright sunny day, colors look more vibrant, contrast is greater, and so on. If we're on a miserable cloudy day, everything looks super flat. Now, if we look at the Luma curve, yes, the contrast has gone up, but if we look at our control up here in the top left, it's almost like we've desaturated it, but it's not actually the case. The, the saturation values are identical if you look at them mathematically, but it's a bit of a trick of the brain um, because um, when contrast goes up, we also, our brain expects saturation to increase by some amount as well, but it doesn't when you use a luminosity curve. Now, the purpose of this exercise is to one, to show you that by using an RGB curve, you can't help influence color, which is maybe fine, but using a Luma curve, it gives you lots of control to add the level of saturation that you feel is necessary for the shot. But the cool thing is the contrast slider sits in between these two. So it's like a blend of RGB and luminosity curves together. So you can push it quite hard and get a nice contrast increase get a little bit of a boost in the saturation so it looks natural, but then it doesn't go totally bananas like an RGB curve can, especially when we're dealing with skin tone. If we look at her arm as an example, you'll see with the RGB curve that her skin tone is getting oversaturated. You can see the wood paneling in the background is kind of starting to get a bit ugly, but with the contrast slider, it's absolutely fine. And if we look at the skin on her arm here, it almost, as I said, looks like it's desaturated, but the uh, contrast slider just sits really nicely in the middle. So really the conclusion is don't be afraid of using the slider. Often we think that, um, where's our contrast one? Here we go. Often we think that using a slider isn't professional enough or whatever, but that's uh, certainly not the case. The contrast slider does a really good job in Capture One. And especially if you're dealing with skin tones, don't be afraid to, to push it and then the skin tones will actually hold on quite nicely. So if we add some contrast in for this guy, again, I wouldn't push it this hard when I was editing normally, but they don't go ready orange and nasty. So it's a, it's a really good subtle control, as uh, Nick said. So what about brightness, as this is kind of a unique uh, tool to capture one? So we've got this shot here, which is a little bit underexposed. So of course your first instinct is to, okay, let's lift up the exposure. So to get her in a suitable place is probably something like that. But the negative consequence of this is that if we look at the shawl on the right hand side, is that it's starting to get a little bit too bright. It's almost uncomfortably bright and it's taking away our focus from our subject. So also, if you look at our histogram, so when I increase exposure, have a look at what's going on up here. It's pretty much like the whole tonal range gets shifted towards the right, which is what we expect because we're you know, brightening everything by relatively the same amount, as you can see. Now, if we use brightness, what this will do is focus a little bit more in the middle and it won't shift the brighter tones quite so much. So if I grab the brightness and push that across, then this moves a little bit, but not as much as if I'd push the exposure. So it's quite a dramatic difference. So to edit this photo, I would open up the brightness probably around here. I might do a little bit of exposure too, but it just means the brighter end of the tonal range hasn't shifted as much with those uh, two controls. So I'd open up the brightness maybe a touch more, a little bit of exposure, and then that's sitting in a nice happy place and this area hasn't got too bright. <clears throat> Another unique tool which I would bring into play with this shot is also the levels tool, which doesn't really exist in Lightroom in the same way. So all the levels tool really does is set your base contrast for the photo based on the information that's in there. So we can see on this shot that we don't have any information from this end of the tonal range. And there's probably a tiny bit here which doesn't have any info as well. So you can either manually drag these points in to set our histogram, 
or you can press auto like so and that would just bring the shadow and highlight points in and really all we're what we're asking capture one to do is just if you imagine picking up either end of the histogram and stretching it out to give us the best tonal range then that's simply what's happening so it's just grabbing the end and stretching it out and you can see as i do this if you watch histogram at the top here then you'll see as i pull this back and forward then it's stretching our histogram out obviously if i start clipping into it it's going to ruin our shot and start giving us those nasty highlights so i would probably stop around there so all we've actually done to this photo is play around with exposure and brightness set the levels and you could almost argue that we're done at that point so if we turn on before and after just this button here gives us this handy slider that we can drag back and forth then we can see the difference that we've made as well if you don't like the slider which some people don't long long press and then you can just get a simple full view so before and after like so another shortcut if you can hold three shortcuts we've got a hand uh, remember the pan tool h crop tool c if you can remember y before and after then that's also a good little handy shortcut to know oh by the way you can also edit all of the shortcuts so if there's a shortcut that you're used to in another application that you want to bring into capture one then you can just do so with edit keyboard shortcuts Okay, so we're going to come back to this photo because we're not quite finished with it, but then we can bring in a few other edits which are a little bit more advanced, um, but we'll just help this picture along. But before we get carried away, we, we really want to look at the, the three main tools, exposure levels, high dynamic range, which pretty much if you're using these three tools and you don't touch anything else, you can actually do some pretty nice editing. Uh, so let's pull out this example as, it, as it's a good extreme example of highlights and shadows. Uh, before we do that, if you want to reset the photo to default, you've got your master reset button at the top, and that will take everything uh, back to default. Sorry, one second. Reset like so. So that will just remove everything and put zero out all the sliders, essentially. So highlights and shadows, um, there's a separate tool for this called high dynamic range. Now, not to be confused with blending, you know, HDR shots or any of that stuff. This tool really uh, deals with the endpoints of your tonal range. So it's dealing with the shadows and it's dealing with the highlights. And there's four sliders which enable you to do that. Might sound overkill, but the, they actually have quite different jobs uh, to do. These behave quite differently to Lightroom, I would say. So don't assume that they necessarily do the same thing. So let's just bring it into the workspace so we can see what we're doing. So highlights, you can probably guess if we pull the highlights down, that's going to make our highlights darker, correct? And that's just a great example in the middle. And if you look at what the histogram is doing, let's actually stick it together so you can see in one spot. If you just hover two tools together, they're magnet and snap together. So now we've got a combined panel. So if we pull the highlights down, then you can see what's happening to our tonal range. It's fairly intuitive. If we pull the whites down, it'll do a similar thing, but it's really focused on the top 5 10%. So it's the critical end control, if you like. So if I pull the highlights down, you can see what happens like so and if we zoom in on our, our subject here pulling the highlights down you see it has a little bit of an effect on the cat's head and the top of the body and so on and you see the histogram gets flattened off like so so it's bringing those bright peaks way way down if we pull the whites down it'll do a similar thing but it's more as i said targeted to the brightest points so if we pull the whites down cat doesn't change very much but you see these brightest areas do. And now if I pull the highlights down, then you'll see the additional effect that the highlights have as well. So the highlights deal with, you know, the top 20% of the tonal range, if you like. The whites is the top 5%, so the critical endpoints. Similar story with uh, the shadows. So let's, if we open up the shadows, then you can see 
our histogram bump here, move its way along the tonal range like so. If we pull the blacks up, it's dealing with the very darkest blacks again. So more like in this area. So if we pull the blacks up, then you see those two peaks compressed and then we brighten the blacks. And the, if I bring blacks to 100, you see that peak to be unscientific stops at around M. Uh, if we bring up the shadows, you see it, it's a greater effect. So again, the shadows have broader range of uh, effect to the photo than the blacks do. Now, if I was going to edit this photo properly and not just play around with sliders, let's just pop those back, I would First of all, remember that we don't want to do this because then we get some weird HDR looking photo, which isn't great. So I would pull my highlights down a little bit and those brighter areas that we see on the paintwork, we could pull those down a little bit more. So you see how it's just controlling those brighter points. So I'd pull those down and I'd open my shadows to some extent. Now, what's quite a nice thing to do, which may sound very, um, unintuitive is to put the blacks in the opposite direction because not only can these open up shadows and brighten the blacks they can also go negatively and the reason why this is also quite nice is sometimes when you open the shadows it can look slightly unrealistic you know not quite natural enough so if you pull the blacks down then it just darkens those deeper blacks and gives you a nice rich contrast in in the shadows so all we've done with this shot is manipulate those four sliders. And if we do our before and after, it's looking pretty good. I'd probably even not go quite so far to keep it looking nice and natural like so. And that does a pretty nice editing job of this shot. White balance, I'm sure all you guys know how to use, works in exactly the same way as really any other raw converter. You can drag the sliders manually, of course, to warm up, cool down and change your tint, or you can grab the picker and then try to find a, you know, a gray balance reference point. But that's really not doing anything different um, than any other raw converter. So I'm sure everybody can appreciate that. Now, the one of the last tools we have down here is clarity. So let's return to our lady over here. So clarity, similar job to contrast, except like the brightness tool, it's focused just in the middle. So of course, if we push our contrast up too much, let's actually pull, pull them out. So if we were to overly pull up contrast too much, the shadows get too dark, the highlights get too bright, doesn't work out nicely. So obviously we still have to exercise a bit of care because contrast will operate almost on the entire tonal range with the specialty that we described earlier. So with clarity, this is again focused in the middle. So if we push up the clarity, then it has you know this nice positive effect of increasing contrast. If I long press on clarity, you can see before and after but without ruining our highlights and blocking up the shadows. I would say if you're used to using Lightroom, you can be more aggressive with clarity before it um, looks ugly. So don't be afraid to maybe go a bit stronger than you would do normally. There are four different methods of clarity, which probably sounds excessive, uh, which <laughs> I would say it is. Uh, the two that you're probably gonna wanna pick between is natural and punch. Punch will do a similar thing, but it will also add a little bit of saturation. So it wouldn't be great for her because it saturates the skin, but you know, on a landscape or something with bright colors or architecture, it can be super, super nice. Uh, the other two are like older methods, like this one hails from Capture One 6, uh, generally doesn't give a nice result, um, but some people like it. And then neutral is kind of the older version of natural. So I'd flip flop between natural and punch pers personally. Uh, structure is this one in focus yeah it's pretty good structure is kind of like a clarity but dealing with you know minute pixel level so if we were to up the structure and I'll push it hard so you can see what's going on then it adds additional details to fine elements so architectural details fur on animals feathers on birds um, grass in a landscape um, leaves on a tree 
those kinds of things. Skin details, which is why you wouldn't want to do it on a family portrait because you're going to exaggerate all our lovely character. But something like this, it could be valued. Now, the only thing I don't like about clarity on this particular photo is the fact that on our lovely Leica, what lens are we using? Uh, let's see, you know, metadata, the 75mm f2. The only thing I don't like on this shot is that when we increase clarity, it has a positive effect on her, but in some ways it has a negative effect on the background because it's, if you like, messing up the lovely transition to the out of focus areas. So wouldn't it be good if we could target our clarity adjustment locally, which we can. So uh, let's put exposure back in here and clarity back in here, wherever we feel like it. And the keen eyed amongst you would have noticed this layers tool, which is fixed by default in the exposure and color tool tabs, and also in the details tool tab, which is where uh, focusing and sorry, sharpening and noise reduction come into play. Probably won't look at that today because for the most part, the default sharpening and noise reduction amounts are tuned to each camera. So if we load up a bunch of different Leica models, they will not necessarily have the same value because it's tailored to the camera. And even though in noise reduction, it always says 50, 50, 50, there's some stuff going on under the hood, depending on the ISO and a few other things. So in your early stages of Capture One, don't worry about these tools too much noise reduction and sharpening per default are doing pretty much a great job. So uh, as I said, the keen eyed amongst you would have noticed the layers tool that sits in those three tool tabs. And this is quite different to Lightroom, whereas Lightroom is purely focused on a adjustment brush workflow. Capture One is closer to Photoshop in that we can define layers. And there's a whole bunch of uh, advantages over that to just the adjustment brush outlook. Again, we won't have time to go into all the little tiny intricacies and brilliance of, of working with layers, but just to give you a super basic example, as I said, I didn't like what Clarity was doing to the background. So I can grab my brush here, go onto my photo, right click to bring up the various um, brush settings. So size and hardness, two obvious ones. Then I can mask on my photo. And if I press M on my keyboard for mask, then I can see where I'm masking. So if I just do a quick and dirty mask, something like that, don't really have to worry yourself too much about being deadly accurate. That's generally the mistake people make. So we've got a basic mask just on the skin tone. Let's name this and call it uh, Clarity Boost, Boost E, Boost. And now notice that the Clarity tool has a little brush next to it. So I know I'm working on a layer. So if I boost my Clarity up now, then it's only affecting those parts. So I'm gonna go to something like that. And if the nice thing is we can turn this layer on and off by using the checkbox to see what it's doing. If you feel you've overcooked it, which can happen regularly, if you've got a, a little bit overzealous, there's no need to go back and try and undo what you've done or change the adjustments or erase it to a certain opacity. You can just slide down the opacity slider and then get the exact effect you want. So I would go for something like that. That's just one layer. We can have up to 16 layers on a photo, which is generally um, enough. So um, what else would I do with this shot? If I just go back to my background, I'd probably just pull the highlights down a little bit. You can see that's affecting her shawl. And another thing is her eyes are slipping into darkness. So I wouldn't mind opening those up a bit. Now, traditionally what I would have to do is kind of similar. I'd make a new layer. I'd mask her eyes. I'd play around with some adjustments to see, um, to give me the best result. That works fine. Uh, but what we added just relatively recently was something called a style brush, which accelerates the creation of layers and the adjustments on those layers. So if layers are a bit intimidating for you, 
then there's the easy solution as well. Now, when you run up Capture One, you're going to see an additional tool sat just here called Style Brushes. Now, as I'm running this on a laptop display at a slightly lower resolution, so it's easy to see, I was kind of running out of space for all the tools I want. So I made myself a custom tool tab, which is why you see this one that says number one, which just has my layers tool and just the style brushes tool. So let's say we want to brighten just the eyes a little bit. Really, really easy. Any of you can do this. Go to the built-in style brushes. We can expand these out. There's 15 that are built in. So I'm going to grab uh, Brighten. So as soon as I click on Brighten, watch what happens. My brush tool is selected. The brush will be set up with various settings that make sense for that brush. Now it's a bit big, so I can make it smaller. As soon as I start brushing, Capture One makes me a layer gives it the name that it's doing and applies all the various adjustments that are going on for that particular style brush. So now I can just brush back and forth. And really importantly, most of these style brushes have this setting called flow set to a very low amount. And what flow does is allow you to build up the adjustment per brush stroke. So whether you're using a pen like me or a mouse, doesn't make any difference. As you brush back and forth, it will build up that adjustment in tiny increments. So like 4%, if you like. So every brush stroke is 4% of the maximum adjustment it could be. So it's kind of like if you're using a, you know, a pencil on paper, the more you scrub with the pencil, the darker it gets. So I'm just going to open up her eyes like so, and a little bit down there. And you might think when nothing's happened at all, David, it looks exactly the same. But if I turn this layer off, then you can see before and after. And again, if you've overcooked it, then you can just pull the opacity down and blend it into something about right, like so. Yeah, and it's, it is, um, Nick, it's a lot like adjustment layers in masks in Photoshop. I saw your comment. Um, there's a lot more that you can do in here um, without going into massive amount of detail, but you can create masks based on luminosity. Uh, you can add gradient masks, you can add a radial mask. So if I make myself a new layer and then drop in a radial mask, we can spin that around, expand it out. And that just simply creates me a nice radial like so. And then I can decide what I want to do with that adjustment. So I can pull my brightness down, which would avoid making the shadows too dark. If I pull the exposure down, you see if you look on her arm, getting a bit too dark down there. So instead of using exposure, I would use brightness like so. So it's really powerful using layers. I'd say it's way more powerful than simply just an adjustment brush because it's much easier to track what each layer is doing rather than having pin spots all over the shot of different adjustment brushes. That's not so easy to follow. As I said, any layer can have a luminosity range applied to it as well which is what this button does too. We've got radial masks pre-built, if you like, gradient masks or linear gradient masks, sorry. Uh, we can also heal and clone as well. So um, I don't think she needs any healing, healing and cloning. Sorry, wrong shortcut. Um, no, it's all pretty clean and dust-free, to be honest. Uh, but if I did want to get rid of something, let's just go to fill for a second and just show you very quickly so you know how it works. Let's go to this one. So pesky seagull, I don't want. It's ruining the seagull balance, if you like. So if I grab my healing brush, that looks like a sticking plaster. Go on to the shot, let's zoom in a bit. Uh, right click to get your brush settings up. Let's make it a bit bigger. Draw on the object, capture one, picks the source point, and away you go. So we could probably even get rid of this one if we wanted to. If you don't agree with the source point, you can just pick it up and move it around. And when you let go, Capture One will blend in um, to the various surroundings so it looks good. Those little arrows stay on screen. If you hover off the screen, then they disappear. So you can have a quick check at what's doing. Like any other layer, you can turn it on and off and you can change the opacity if you wanna blend it in as well. All right, let's have a quick look at color. 
before we need to export. Uh, so let's go and find our colorful kids. This is also one of the strengths of, of Capture One in a big way because we've got really nice control over color, certainly with the color editor. So the color editor is split into three tabs, basic, advanced, and skin tone. Probably won't have a chance to look at skin tone, but, but really the purpose of that tab is to unify skin tones. So if you have a, a subject which has varying skin tones, which we all have, like under the eyes, often on the cheeks, down on the neck, forehead or whatever, you can pretty much target your preferred skin tone and compress everything towards that. So if you shoot people, that's a, a brilliant tool and it's way easier than doing it in Photoshop. In terms for simple color edits, you've got a couple of choices. So you can either pick manually the color swatch that you want to adjust. You'll see the sliders change because they indicate what's going to happen when you pull the sliders. So probably I'm guessing his uh, trousers are going to shift. So if I drag uh, lightness down, then it's just going to affect the colors in that range. And also it's picking up a bit of red in his as well. So if I wanted to darken that down, boost saturation, change the hue, either way we can make him more magenta and more or more orange, then we can do so. So that's one way to do it. If you're not sure which color swatch to pick, you can grab the picker and then click anywhere. Sorry, click anywhere and then capture one will pick the right swatch for you. And then now I'm free to play around and adjust. Equally, let's reset that. Uh, there's something called the direct color editor. So you can just go over to the color you want to edit. And now I'm going to click and hold uh, with my mouse. So watch what happens to the cursor down here. When I click and hold, it's going to change to a four way arrow and then disappear. So now what I can do, I can move my mouse or pen left, right, up and down to manipulate the sliders. So if I go to the left, that's going to darken. If I drag my mouse to the right, then it's going to lighten and you can see his shirt changing. If I drag up, then the saturation is going to go up. If I drag down, then the saturation is going to go down. So you can just manipulate without having to pull the sliders. Now there's a third axis hue. How do I access that? So that's hold down option or alt on your keyboard and drag left and right. And then now we can change the hue. The other difference between those, you'll see what happens. Notice when you start dragging, if you look at the I can't highlight it because I've got my mouse held down. <laughs> but if you look at over at the basic color editor, you'll see two swatches have been picked. So when you're using the direct color editor in this way, it will actually manipulate more than one color swatch at the same time. And this will give you, if you like, an overall more accurate adjustment. Now, the cool thing is about the advanced color editor is that it gives you one extra value to play with if you like. So basic just allows us to edit color. But when we're editing a color, it edits the entire saturation range. So when we pick red, if you like, we are adjusting any red color that's in the photo, even if it's really saturated or not very saturated. So if I go to his shirt, for example, and play around with lightness, you can actually see in the background and also on the floor, it's having some influence here as well. So if I just drag back and forth, you can see that change. So in the advanced color editor, which might look a bit intimidating, first of all, gives you the ability to either have a super narrow color range or a really broad one, and also the saturation range as well. So if I was to grab the picker and pick his shirt once more, Capture One gives me a suggested color range, which we can always edit. But this axis from the center to the edge, this is our saturation range. So if I turn on this little checkbox view selected color range, Capture One shows me everything in the photo that's selected. So everything goes to monochrome, which is out of that color selection. So if I was to expand this to the reds, I'd actually pick up his trousers too. If I went even further, I'd eventually pick up his blue jacket. But if I compress that down, and then if I didn't want this kind of dirt on the wall, 
I would say let's cut out the lower saturated parts. And then you can see when we get to that point, we actually lose a bit of his shirt as well. So you can be super critical about exactly which color range you want to edit. So this is, if you like, your extension of basic, just allows you to have very small color range selection or very broad color range selection and gives you that third element of playing with saturation. Now that's just one pick. So if I turn off view selected color range, sorry, and then say pick his jacket, that gives me another pick. So I can play around with these different uh, color selections like so. And I can have up to 30 of those. So it's, you know, it's way more extensive than what the basic uh, color editor can do as well. So that's a, you know, a super awesome tool. Also, when it comes to color, you have this guy, the color balance tool, which has been in Capture One for quite some years now. Whereas the color editor to define the difference, let's close black and white, the color editor to define the difference really is to select a color and change its appearance. Uh, the color balance tool is about either removing color casts or adding them for creative reasons. Any of you can learn how to use this in one minute if you like. Um, so really what you're doing is applying a tint to the shadows, midtones, or highlights or the photo overall if you're in the master one. So in the master tab, if I pick up the middle and just push it to a particular area, that's simply like putting a colored filter in front of the lens. So if you wanted to warm everything up a bit, then you can do so simply like that. The further you go to the edge of the circle, the stronger it gets, easy. With the three-way tool, the shadows, midtones, and highlights are just separated. So if you wanted to have colder shadows, but warmer midtones and warmer highlights, then you can do so. And you've also got some density control. So we can make the shadows darker or brighter, midtones brighter or darker, and so on. So this is a great tool for creative color grading. The nice thing about this, and coming back to layers, which you could never easily do with an adjustment brush, is that we could make ourselves a field adjustment layer, which is very similar to Photoshop. Call this uh, color grading, uh, grading, like so. So that's a field adjustment layer. So if I press M on my keyboard, you see it affects the whole shot. So now what I can do is I can do my color grade. So let's just play around like this. And what I could also do is bring in some other elements. So if I wanted to go for like more muted colors, I could also bring my saturation down like so. But because it's on a layer, I can turn it on and off to see what it's doing. I can pull my opacity down if I think I've overcooked it or find that, you know, happy medium. So field layers are just as useful as, you know, drawn layers, if you like. Okay, um, I see we have reached our almost extra five to 10 minute limit. So what I'm gonna do is just quickly show you export. And there's two places to look, which is gonna sound confusing, which it is but it's also being um, improved as well. So uh, for export, if you remember, we said up here, we've got import. Next to that, you'll find export. So this export button here is if you like the quick and dirty method. So if I decide I wanna export this shot to JPEG, TIFF or whatever, I can press export and it will bring me up a um, simple dialogue, which asks me to define where it's going if we want to pop them in a subfolder and then ask me any other basic decisions about the file format, sizing and so on. So this will give me a JPEG that's sized to 2000 pixels on the long edge and it's going to pop it in a subfolder called Robin in my pictures folder. So if I now hit export, capture one will wear away and now it's completed. So if I go to my pictures folder, uh, you can see there's Robin and there's our JPEG file like so. That's fine, but let's say I also want to have a TIFF file. So I'd have to go back into my export dialog, change my format to TIFF, uh, change this to fixed, I want 100% maximum size and any other parameters. Now I can say export, capture one is done and there's the 
big TIFF file like so. So it's slightly inefficient to have to keep going in and out of that dialog, which is why if you look at the very last tool tab, we have the ability to preset your exports. So essentially what you'll see by default is a bunch of different options that you can make. Let's just delete some of them. I think you end up with these five and an install and capture one. And you can simply say, I want to have a JPEG and I want to have a TIFF. So I can kick off two processes or three or four or five at the same time. And then when I highlight this individual recipe, notice down here that the parameters change. So this one is going to give me a TIFF. This one is going to give me a JPEG with these settings. And then I just have to define an output folder. So I'm going to choose my pictures folder again, or let's just chuck it straight into uh, Robin. Set this output folder, subfolder, let's just call it, um, oh no, we just pop them straight into Robin. And now when I say process, it will kick off those two recipes at the same time. So that's, if you like, way more efficient. So if we now look in Finder, and there's, it's just drop those two additional ones in there like so. So this is just really a way more efficient way of doing it. And the good news is, um, because it's kind of stupid to have an export dialog there and also the process recipes, we're actually going to kind of combine that into just one easier to follow output dialog. Uh, the reason why we have this kind of weird export dialog in the free version of Capture One we have for Sony and Fuji, for example, they only have access to this export dialog, not the nice process recipes like so. Um, so that will all be compressed into one easier to follow export dialog in the not too distant future. But there's plenty of tutorials on setting up process recipes, but it's really just a case of hit plus to make your recipe, fill in the parameters down here, define where you want to go. And you can also set up some output naming as well if you want to change the output name on export. But it's super, super efficient way to do it and better than going into the export dialog. Okay, Nick, I think that probably gives us a good little tour and um, compensating for our lack of time in the middle. I've already learned a couple of things. Um, <laughs> any questions that have... Yes, if anybody's got any questions, please do. Got, there's a couple of questions that we haven't answered yet. So okay. if people are thinking of questions, then um, go we could go for that. Uh, just go, uh, presets for the different Leica cameras. Um, yep. I'm not sure whether that's presets or profiles. Maybe you could just say a few, word about, a few words about what cameras or lenses, camera lens combinations are actually built in with the uh, camera profiles. I can see you've got one there on the screen sure. now. So you'll it? see if you if I just flick through different cameras. So this is an M240 by the looks of it. So there's an SL2 as we mm -hmm. can see. So so this tool, the base characteristics tool, you pretty much don't have to touch really. It just recognizes what the camera is and loads the correct profile for the camera. And Does when I say profile, that sorry Nick. Is there one for the CL in there? Uh, pretty sure there is. Uh, let's see. If we just go down here, we can okay. see. Well, there you are. Yeah. That's the question. <laughs> All of yeah. them. Brilliant. I think okay. So that was uh, Michael Whitby. So that's answered his and question. Someone, I think, before um, I got uh, disconnected, asked about the Q2 as yes, well. Yes, that's right. So there is a, yeah. there is a profile there. That was, um, well, where are we? Uh, yes, that was Amit's question earlier yeah. on. So yes, so the answer is, is definitely yes. And, um, and if Amit's not question. seeing it, he just needs to make sure he's running the latest version because new camera models get added as we add mm -hmm. new versions of, of Capture One. Um, yeah, looks so nice. yeah, really this tool you don't have to, to touch. Uh, the, the profile is created um, by us in Copenhagen. Um, each camera is treated very differently, if you like, or individually. So there's not just a blanket profile that is Leica, if you like. And even between something like a, uh, a camera where perhaps even the sensor is the same between generations, doesn't mean that it's automatically supported. We still do a complete new profile 
for any camera, even if it is sharing the same sensor. I'm impressed that you've got the Q2 monochrome in there and you've got the SL2S in there. I mean, that's it was only came out before Christmas, so that's right up to date. That's the yeah, SL2. and we, we actually had support for that at the same day you launch, which is yeah. nice yeah. because yeah, we do have right. a collaboration to to get early access to to new stuff that's coming yes there's so there's actually a bit of a away. sort of a connection between like oh, absolutely uh, um, capture absolutely. one pro now and in fact um, david trained us in how to use capture one pro for tethering which works with the sl2 and the sl2s yep. very well and in fact there's a video i did about it on our youtube channel re relatively um sort of thin on the ground technically but showing how it works and it works pretty just, easy it's just Plug it in and take a picture. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, the only thing you might okay. find is there's two profiles to choose from, generic and pro standard. Pro uh, standard is, if you like, a new method of profiling that we introduced recently, which should give you better colors, better transitions from higher saturated colors to lower saturated colors, greater accuracy, and so on. So okay. the only thing you might want to consciously do is pick that. Okay. Good to yeah. know. Didn't know that. The All only right, reason then. why the old one is still there is if you are, you know, a legacy customer, you wouldn't want us to mess with your color profiling if you'd done some color editing. Yeah, so that's a bit. But if you <laughs> wanted to have pro standard by default, pick it and then say, save as uh, defaults for neat. SL2. Neat. That's it. All right. So now any SL2 that comes in is going to be um, pro standard. Yeah. Awesome. That's really clever. I didn't know that either. I'm, I've been learning yeah, all sorts this evening. I've been I'd watching it. That. <laughs> okay, Maybe so more questions, can... um, if I may. Uh, yeah. Just one just popped in. There's another one from earlier. Oh, Ralph Domino wanted to know what about what are scripts i don't know if that's maybe a complicated one to answer but um maybe you could make a few comments on that yeah it's it's mac only so apologies to to pc owners but um essentially capture one is fully enabled for apple script so if you actually know how to um work with apple script then you can automate a bunch of stuff in Capture One. So if you wanted it to, I don't know, create a bunch of different layers, give them all certain names, add certain tools, wow. all kinds of things. It's mostly used for e-commerce, if I'm honest. So shooting e-com. So they will, you know, pick up a product, barcode scan it, barcode will be read. It will set up a capture folder based on that name, change the naming convention and set up a whole lot of other things as a automated process. So that's generally okay. what it's used for. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Impressive. Um, <laughs> Jack Gibson would like to know if the latest version of capture one includes profile corrections for the L mount Sigma lenses on the SL cameras. Good. Or is it just, actually. it's in Let's the open questions. A... Yeah. Check uh, Sigma. So we can see all the Sigmas. Um, we do have a pretty tight relationship with Sigma. So getting them mm -hmm. won't be an issue. Um, mm -hmm. So I will mention that to the test department because that, that's a good point, actually. So mm -hmm. um, I, I know they're relatively popular. I'm sure, Nick, you prefer everyone to buy Leica lenses, but... Um, <laughs> We, there are quite a few lenses that Sigma make that Leica don't make. So yep. there are some fairly, not, and there are some quite exotic ones amongst their range too. So, yeah. so yes, I, <laughs> you're right. Actually, but then again, I appreciate the difference. There's a chance that they might be supported by default, and I'd have to just mm. remind me to check, Nick. But what you'll see is for something like the SL and the SL2, um, in the profile list, you'll either see the lens name, mm -hmm. Or you'll see something called manufacturer profile. Oh, okay. So what manufacturer profile means is that there's enough data in the raw file for us to be able to do a distortion. Yeah, correction. yeah, yeah, yeah. Because there is a lot of software. The, exactly. There's a lot of software stuff built into the lenses. There's a lot more computational exactly. stuff going on these days. Um, I know exactly. even Leica use computational corrections that we don't get access to. It's built into the raw file. Um, so yes, exactly. I mean you'd know more. <laughs> about that so there's a chance with the sigma l lenses that they may already be supported by default with manufacturer profile yeah, yeah. it's just Excellent. something 
I'd have to check actually. Okay. So if All you right. see the name of the lens, that means we've uh, done a lens calibration in factory. And really that adds two additional sliders, sharpness fall off, which probably doesn't happen a lot, and uh, light fall off. And if by default you see them all at zero, that simply means that we don't feel that they're enough of an issue to correct by default. So this is, you know, at 46 mil. So we feel that the distortion, sharpness and light fall off is so minimal that we won't actually adjust it. Um, of course, if you wish, you can, I mean, look, if I move this between zero and 100, you see there's relatively, you know, nothing really changing. So that's why we tend to leave these on zero sometimes. So it's up, up to you. Uh, chromatic aberration is always on. This one, diffraction correction, is off by default. And you should only turn on diffraction correction if you're shooting at a very small aperture. So I don't know if there's any in oh, here which okay. are... That's interesting. And, and, mm, so that's a sharpening effect, removing diffraction. It's, yeah, it's a sharpening effect. So wow. when you probably... Ah, here we go. Um, there's another landscape. You probably won't be able to see on a webinar, you know, slightly compressed view. Let's just open up the chat. So if I zoom into something ridiculous mm. and we turn on diffraction correction. So this is at F16. And what diffraction yeah. is when you when you get to a certain small aperture, then the light scatters as it goes through the aperture blades and will cause a softening. So diffraction mm. correction will try to counteract that, if you like. Uh, so let's just stick the right lens in. So if we turn that on and then do before and after. Oh, hang on. Let's just do the split view slider. Mm. Hard to see. You really. Yeah, hard to see. Yeah. Oh, let's just correct the exposure, actually, as we're in the trees and go to 400%. So there we go. There's a yeah, minor yeah, yeah. improvement in yeah. sharpness, yeah. as yeah. you can see there. Um, well, that's just be aware that if you have diffraction correction turned on, it will take longer to export to TIFF, JPEG, and so on. Um, and there's no point having it on at smaller apertures. You'll get absolutely no benefit to it. <laughs> <Makes> sense. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all right. Anybody got any last minute questions? That's all the Q&A questions answered. I think I've got everybody from the chat. If there's cool. anybody else who's got a last minute question but look david thank you for that i know we've got a limited amount of space of time rather and um there is a, i think one thing that you've shown us this evening is that there is an astonishing depth that you can drill down to that's not at all obvious at first glance i mean that color editor and the fact that you can do like luminosity masking on various effects gives you astonishing power to the point where you could argue it's probably much on a par with photoshop in certain things which is saying something um i hope everybody has sort of understood what you're looking at here it's a it's a when you call it a professional version of, of, of what, what I meant, that means is it has tools in there which are not necessarily applicable to everybody but they're there if you need them um the other thing which i'll but to point out is that Capture One Pro has led Lightroom in many respects. There's a lot of tools in there that have, that have been in it for years that you're only just seeing in like, like the color grading tool only just came out the last version. The um, geometric distortion, the, 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 the keystoning tool, that was something I lusted after for years in Lightroom and it's been in Capture <laughs> One for donkey's years. <laughs> but there's a learning curve and, and so on. So um, if you want to uh, really push your images a little bit further, it's entirely possible Capture One Pro will be the tool for you. So we have just put in the chat that discount voucher. Um, that's 25% uh, of the products uh, on the, the main Capture One Pro website. That's right, isn't it, David? So yeah. um, that should be the full version of Capture One Pro, obviously. So that, um, so Am Amit says about the upgrade pricing for Capture One Pro, is it possible? Oh, hang on. There was a, a, he asked me a question earlier. Just give me a sec, Amit. I'll come back to it. Yeah, uh, yeah Ralph I was just reading it, so I've got, I've got an answer yeah, for him as well. Comment on those questions, David. Yeah, in regards to Amit's question, that's that's totally fair as well. But what you all would have seen in the past um, two or three months, I guess, we had a, a change of CEO around just before Christmas, I think. So Raphael Orta is now our CEO of Capture One. And one of the things he wanted to change was exactly what 
Amit is speaking about is that previously we had a very closed um, roadmap. Uh, so we were very tight-lipped about what was coming in the in the future uh, until it was released, and then we would talk about it. But over the past few months, what we've done is actually start to speak about publicly uh, what's coming in the future. So we some the style brushes that I showed that was released before they were coming out. Uh, we've spoken about support for Apple M1 Max um, with a timeline for that, and actually there's a few more things that are coming up in the future, which we're also going to talk about openly as well, like the unified export that I spoke about. I, you know, in, in the old days, I never would have mentioned that before um, it was actually in the software. But now there's freedom to, to talk about, you know, what's coming as well. So, I mean, you should not come into that situation again where you don't know what you're getting in the future, if you like, because um, I totally agree it's very difficult to make a purchasing decision if you don't know what you're buying. So. Yeah. <laughs> and there's a question from Ralph Domino as well in there for you. Um, how many downloads per purchase? Uh, it would be so two installs. Two so installs. you can install it on two different machines. Yeah. Okay. All right. Look, David, thank you so much for your time this evening or this morning, I should say. This <laughs> Very convenient for you. It's terrible when we do um, work presentations with the United States because it's really awkward working out a time. Yeah, in the middle of the night. The yep. <laughs> You're nicely yeah, in the Australia middle. Australia is easy. It's much better than the US for me because that's normally <laughs> yes, at nine o'clock right. at night or whatever. Yep. <laughs> so um, thank you, everybody else, for, for turning up. Like I said, I put that um, um, uh, discount voucher code, uh, like a dash AU in capitals, in the chat there. So have a look at the website. Check that out. There is a demo, of course, available, which you can can download for free and check that out but uh, that that voucher is valid for three days so don't delay um i suspect because there is this burgeoning partnership with um capture one and Leica that we will be doing more um uh, seminars like this or web webinars i should say and i'm hoping at some point in not too distant future we might get Demi back to do something a bit more advanced um sure. we did discuss this internally and in Leica academy and we realized that none of us are quite qualified to to teach it properly so we're all busy scrambling around the background trying to upskill in capture one but it made a lot more sense to go to the person who does it all the time so that's david <laughs> <laughs> So, Demi, thank you so much for uh, for Thanks, sharing us your wisdom and demonstrating the um, the software. And to everybody who's taken part, thank you very much. I will hopefully see you again in the not too distant future. Um, we'll be announcing our next um, series of webinars in the next few weeks, and hopefully, well, like I said, we'll get that on a on a regular basis. So, uh, good evening from Nick, and good evening. Thank you very much, David. Good morning from me. <laughs> Cheers, Nick. Take care. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye.